So we've been in First Peter, but um, as you can tell by looking around, we've got a lot of people on the road and traveling for fall break this week, and um, we hope that they have a great time with their family and they get to enjoy enjoy this season where the kids are out of school. Um, so we're going to go to Matthew chapter six, verses twenty four through thirty four, and we'll pick up in First Peter next week. But Matthew six twenty four through thirty four is probably one of my favorite passages of scripture. It's the first. Um, section of scripture that I remember memorizing. Um, so it's the first pastor of scripture I put to memory. And um, back a long time ago, the first sermon I preached was on Matthew 6, 24 through 34. So it's been one of those passages of scripture that, um, I mean, I, not only do I love it, I, so many people love it. I mean, it's, when we, when we read it, you'll know, okay, well, this is, this is what this passage says. But, uh, Matthew 6, 24 through 34, we're going to read it together and we'll pray. And um, and we'll just jump right in. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for your word and the way it's able to build us up. We're thankful for how much you care for us and how you provide for us, Lord, and how you free us from anxiety-driven pursuits of the wrong things and replace that with faithful, driven pursuits of your reign and your righteousness and the um, seeing that lived out in the lives of people created in your image for the sake of your glory, God. And I pray that you would free us from anxiety and remind us who you are, empower us to be kingdom-minded, kingdom-driven people, and... Um, Set us on a path where we seek first your reign in our lives, your rule in our families, in our homes, at our workplace, in our society at large, God, in our community, um, that we might be a people who embody your will on earth as it's done in heaven. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the sentence summary for Matthew 6, 24 through 34, um, and this is not, this is not the, even though this was the first sermon I preached, this isn't necessarily the first sermon. I'm not preaching the first sermon again. That's one of the things about God's word. You, you go to a text and you preach it and you come back to it a couple of years later and you're like, oh, wow. <laughs> Those people were really, really kind to put up with me. Um, but this is the way I would summarize this passage. Um, the one who feeds the birds and clothes the grass feeds and clothes us. And he does so that we can seek his reign and his rule instead of being um, put on a crippled uh, pursuit of things that don't matter by our anxiety. That's, that's just what he does. He feeds us and clothes us and reminds us of this so that we don't spend our life in a never-ending pursuit that looks like freedom, but it is actually just us being crippled by the fear of not having or the fear of missing out or whatever you want to call it, and it just leads to, to fruitlessness. And so we're going to just read Matthew 6, 24 through 34 and walk through it. That's the best way to do it, I think. Um, Jesus starts off by saying that no one can serve two masters, for he'll hate the one and love the other, 
This is the reason you can't serve two masters. Or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Matthew 6, 24, it's, you guys have heard me make this point before if you've heard me preach. Um, it's, this passage seems like it's a passage that deals with anxiety, right? Like our good Lord, the provider of every good and perfect gift doesn't want us to be anxious. And he doesn't. That's true. But one of the things that this passage is really focusing on is preserving the thing that we love, right? So Jesus isn't, the impetus behind this passage is not, I see all you people out there, you're super anxious. I'm going to help you not be anxious anymore. I feed you, I clothe you, you know, it's done. You don't have to be anxious. You're welcome. You're welcome. You know, what he's, what he's concerned with is how anxiety, right, in general, what it says about our affections and who we love and the eventual pursuit that it leads us on and the path that it leads us down. Um, and you see it right here, he says, you can't serve two masters because what's at stake is hate and love. That's one way to put it. Another way to put it is what's at stake is devotion and despising, right? So at the very heartbeat of all of this is Jesus looking at us and saying, hey, I want you to be devoted to the right thing, and I want you to love the right thing. Because if you don't, the opposite side of this is despising and hating, all right? And so that's, that's the framework that he speaks to us about just being a person, all right? Because as a person, there are some things that we need to survive. We need food, and we need clothing, and shelter and things like that. So he's, he's speaking to these common needs, but he knows how we're wired and he knows how we work and he knows how we, how we live. And um, one of the things I think that Jesus is trying to do in this text, I mean, because it comes um, after the Sermon on the Mount, it's, it's a text that's given to his disciples, is he's trying to make us through and through kingdom-minded Individual. So something came up in our Sunday school class. They did an excellent job teaching. Um, and uh, may, may I share that story of you and Lowe's? Is that okay? So Eddie was at Lowe's, and um, the Holy Spirit told him to go and to speak to this man, and, and Eddie went right into Lowe's. You know, that's the way, <laughs> that's the way it happens, right? He just went right into Lowe's. Um, and I know that's probably happened to every single one of us at some point, right? We, we, you know, we, know, we knew that the Lord wanted us to do something, but we, we rationalize it away. We're busy. We don't have time, and we, we go about our business and, um, and whatnot. Uh, but Micah was commenting on this. Uh, Micah Joy in the back there. You can just raise his hand if you haven't known, seen Micah before. He's, he's usually drinking the slushies, the smoothies when he's here. Um, <laughs> but he, <laughs> Micah made a great point, and he said, I think one of the things that we all struggle with is that we, we live a normal life, Right? We, we live this normal life, and this normal life includes going to Lowe's, and it includes um, going to Target or going to Aldi or going to, you know, going to work. We, we live normal lives, and what we try to do is we try to fit kingdom realities into these normal everyday lives that we live, right? And this passage, um, I think, is intended not so that we can live an anxious, free, normal life while we segment the kingdom realities that we're called to in specific moments, right? But rather, this, this, this text right here, this, this passage is meant to actually throw away the concept of a normal life, and it, and it makes us kingdom-driven and aware people that find that when we live this way, we are far less anxious than we were when we lived that way. Or to put it differently, what, what God's really about is not us being able to figure out how he works in an everyday normal moment. What God's about is, is taking all of these moments and, and transporting them and transforming us into kingdom-minded people so that the more that we live in the everyday interactions that we have, they're all kingdom-saturated interactions. They're kingdom-saturated moments. They are what we are and what we, 
what we offer to people is God's reign and his rule and his will embodied in us. And that way, when we go to work, when we go to Lowe's, when we go to the grocery store, when we're having a conversation with our wife, with our kids, what we see is God's kingdom. And we define God's kingdom as his reign, his rule, his, his will being done pointing hearts and minds and souls to Christ and and taking every thought captive and making it obey Christ so that Christ reigns supreme in our affections and our emotions and our interactions and in the way we spend our money and the way we love our wives and love our kids and love each other, right? We see a manifestation of God's reign when we walk just into the bank or into Lowe's or have that conversation with someone on the phone. What we're seeing is God's kingdom breaking in, breaking through, reigning, ruling in the hearts of his people. And that's what I think Matthew 6 is trying to get at, right? He's trying to speak to people that are like, you know, have you seen interest rates on mortgages lately? You know, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to get this? How are we going to buy a house? What are we going to do? We're going to be stuck written for, I mean, you know, have you seen the price of clothing, seen the price of food? What are we going to, and that's just the way we are. That's right. And, it, and it, this passage meets us there and it goes, okay, hey, 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 let's, let's back up. What we seek, we seek God's kingdom, his reign, his rule, the rule of Christ in our lives, right? And then as we exist, we exist primarily for those things. And we're able to put into, you know, money, well, clothing, what we need, that goes into its proper place. But what happens is the pursuit is after the things of God primarily. Everything runs through that filter. What job I take, how we spend the money, the activities our kids are involved in, what we watch on television, the music that we listen to, who we hang out with, what boundaries we set, all those things. They're kingdom principled realities. And then that's how I think that we make a difference in the world. And when we can kind of get there, we are a lot less anxious about, um, about other stuff. Now, verse 24, no one can serve two masters, who hate the one, love the other, spy, devote to the one, despise the other. You can't serve God and money. Um, and I've, this is the point you've heard me made. You know, how do you serve money? Like, how do you, how do you serve money? What, what's interesting about Money or wealth or the things that we use to transact to get a good or a commodity or whatever, right? Jesus uses that same word serve, right? And he sees a relationship between what we do with money and what we do with God. And so we, you know, how do you serve God? Well, I think you can answer that in part by figuring out how you serve money. Well, how how do we not serve serve money. We, we can't serve it like I would try to serve Beth, right? Like try to, you know, do the help, help out with laundry or just be a decent person or, you know, the things I try to do every day to make her life a little bit easier, you know, just be kind. Um, take her on a date. We don't want to do those things, right? We can't, we can't serve money that way. You can't pour a cup of coffee. I guess you could. It just sat there. Um, the way that you serve money is you serve money by putting money right? By putting your faith and trust in money to be the thing that you need it to be and to get the thing that you need to have. You serve money by trusting it, by strategizing around it, by, and and those of you that love money, this is what you do. You look at it. Where can I put it? Where can I move it? How can I protect it? How do I leverage? What can it offer me, right? And you look at your future. I can retire at this age if I have this. That's the way we serve. That's what we do when we serve money, We actually lift it up and say, okay, meet the needs I have. Make me happy, buy my medicine, get my food, give me a place to live, help me build a life for my spouse, my kids, whatever. That's how we serve money. Well, what Jesus says is you can't have that kind of relationship with money and God at the same time. Money is the ultimate alternative to God. That's why so many people struggle with it because it promises to be for us all that God says that he already is. 
And the real danger with wealth, being wealthy is not inherently sinful, but the danger with wealth is that wealth appeals to the inward person and our own abilities to reason and to think and to foresee and to strategize and to move in order to make it work for us to get what we want. And so it fills this fuels this pride in us, and we can actually do what we need to do with it and be really savvy, okay? Well, that's how you serve money. That's (laughs) Conversely, when you serve God, what you do is you take this line of thinking where having money is the end-all, be-all so that it can get you the things that you want, right? Serving God is different in that what it does, what we do, is we look to God, not the exact same way we look to money, but we look to God in a similar way to prioritize our lives, right? We look to him to strategize for us, to give us some sort of marching out orders, to give us a vision for how we should interact in the workplace or with our spouse. And, and we say, okay, you're, you are going to be good for me. The good that I decided for myself that I purchased with money, I actually bring to you and say, okay, you know, number one, what's good, and you know, number two, how to obtain it. And what happens when we live that way is the anxiety that comes from this over here, which is all driven by fear of loss. I got to have, I got to strategize, I got to plan, I got to do, that's, that's replaced with a, with a lot less anxiety, a lot more love, and a much more fruitful journey. Because what Jesus sees sees here are people that are going to seek something. And you you are all on a pursuit of something. And you can kind of look at what you do in life and how your schedule goes to figure out what you're pursuing. And what, and Jesus says, hey, normal, everyday, unconverted people, that's what Gentiles represent here. Unconverted people seek all the things that you feel like you need. And they're on a pursuit of those things. You've heard it called the rat race. You know, the rat race, we're in the race of life and all that. All that. that that's what that is. That's that natural base, just pursuit of the thing that we need to survive. And, and when you take it a little bit deeper, the things that we need to be happy or to give us joy. And that's why we make decisions on the sports that our kids play. We like them to have joy and we want to experience the joy. And then, you know, and then you get the pull and okay, well, how serious does this get? If I don't do this, what will they be missing out on? Right. And then suddenly next thing you know, you don't have any boundaries for your own personal life because you've gone all into something else. And that's just the way it works. That's the way it works. Not only with a uh, travel sports team, but that's the way it works with, um, with money, our hobbies, what we commit to, right? And there's all this stuff that's going on underneath that's driving the decisions that we make that we don't even realize most of the time. But what we're after is some sort of purpose, some sort of joy, some sort of reality. And then we end up just, you know, like me and like Eddie, like all of us, we're like, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fit kingdom stuff into this box here as, I, as I'm on the way to do the things I have to do. And, you know... That's just what it means to be a person. That's why I say um, it's really hard to be a person sometimes. So Jesus says in verse 25, therefore I tell you, don't be anxious about your life. No one can serve two masters. If you do, you're going to end up loving one and hating the other one. And you're going to end up despising the one and being loyal to the other. So now I'm going to tell you something that, that directly relates to that reality. This, this is the way this is going, right? This this teaching this conversation, which is, you're like, okay, well, you would expect something like, all right, well, we need to be true to, you know, we have to love the right thing and we have to be true to, and that's, but the next thing out of his mouth is, therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious about life. And you think, what in the world does being anxious about life have to do with serving a master? Well, it has everything to do with serving a master. The problem is, is we just don't stop for two seconds to think about why we do the things that we do. You know, Paul says, whatever is not from faith is sin. Anybody know that verse? Yeah, everybody knows that verse? You know, one of the things that verse calls us to do is to actually take an inventory of what we're doing and say, why am I doing it? Is it from faith or is it from fear? Is it fear? Is it, is it grounded in God's faithfulness to me or is it grounded in fearful anxiety that the only person I can trust is me? 
which is what we call faithlessness. And one of the reasons that Jesus says, hey, what's on, what is at stake here in the way you spend your money and the way that you leverage whatever you leverage to get whatever you think you need? That's what's at stake here. It's not just money. It's the things that we leverage in life. It could be power. It could be position. It could be um, whatever it is that you use, you leverage to give you what you need to feel satisfied, like feel good about yourself. J- Jesus says, hey, you got to figure out where it's coming from. If you're anxious about your life, if you're scared to death of not having anything at the end of the day, like, and that's a, that's a fear. I know plenty of people who I would consider wealthy today. And one of the reasons they're wealthy today is because 20 day, 20 years worth of days ago, I'm not good enough at the math to tell you how many days that is. They didn't have anything. They didn't have anything. They know what it's like to have nothing. And now, the thing that drives their having that they have to work on is the fearful anxiety of not having. So even in having what we would consider everything, they possess nothing. Because in their mind, they might as well not have it. And, it's, and this is what Jesus, is, he knows how we work, right? He knows how the mind goes. He knows what poverty looks like, and he knows what abundance looks like. And he says there's danger in every aspect of it. Because if, if we can't, right, if we can't align our heart with the kingdom reality, well, the anxiety about our life, what we eat, what we drink, or our body, what we will put on, It'll drive us to make all sorts of decisions that aren't based in faith, that that don't push us into kingdom reality. And he says, you know, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Of course it is. There's there's more to life than food, right? Isn't there more to life than eating? Isn't there more to your body than just what you cover it with? Look at the birds that neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than a bird? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Look at what you, what's, you know, I've said that to Sutton, actually, the other day. Um, I said, you know, you can't add any, any, you can't add one more minute to your life by being anxious about it. But why does that, why does that, statement works so well though what is it undercover what is it what is it uncovering can't add a can't add a day to your life by worrying about it it's uncovering i think this this bad thinking that that we that we actually can add a day to our life if we just worry enough about it if we just eat the right things and run the right distances and stop drinking sweet and low and substituting it for stevia, which is just nasty. We won't get cancer. You know, you're like, like that's what we, that's what we do. That's what he means when he says, which one of you by worrying can add one hour to your life. He's undercutting this premise that we actually can control it. If we just manage it, wield it, make it work for us, utilize it, strategize with it. We're kingdom builders, man. We send rockets to the moon. Of course we can. And Jesus says, of course you can't. And that is, that is the problem. He sees us on this pursuit, ignorant of the kingdom, of God's reign and rule in the hearts of men. Because our hearts have been fooled into thinking that we can actually do something beneficial to self by our own strategies and with our own devices. And that's that's why this works so well. That's why he kind of throws it in there. You know, it, it, it seems like an interruption. You know, are you not more valuable than a bird? Hey, which one of you by worrying can add an hour to your life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God both clothes the grass of the field, 
and the birds of the air, right? If he clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, don't be anxious saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Where should we go? You just add all the things to that. Should we buy? Should we sell? Should we stay? Should we move? When you seek those things, you don't seek after anything different than what everyone else seeks after. That's what he means when he says, for the Gentiles seek after all these things. And yet, there is a gentleness to Jesus that says, and your father knows you need these things. And so he comes to us, and this text approaches us right here in this room. It, it approaches us with all, and it, with all the decisions that we make, that we make every day, how we run our house, how we make our schedules, what activities we put our kids in, how we spend our money, right? It, it, it approaches us, and it says, and Jesus says, you have two choices here. You can seek after what everybody else seeks after. Or there's another reality that's unseen that's as small as a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. You can barely see it. If I had it up here on my finger, you couldn't even see it. Smallest of all the seeds, but when you plant it in the ground, it becomes a massive tree and the birds of the, of the air go and they make their home in it. Jesus says, you can run after all the things that you can see and everybody else sees a million miles away or there's this tiny seed, a tiny flicker of light that very few people acknowledge and very few people see. And he says, you can have a life that is anxiety-driven, seeking the things that everyone else seeks, or you can receive the love of God that's in Jesus Christ. A massive diminishment of your anxiety. Listen, y'all, anxiety is real. Sometimes if you deal with anxiety, you are anxious when there is nothing to be anxious about. Okay? I don't necessarily think he's talking about a generalized anxiety disorder that you need to go seek help with. That's not necessarily, I think, on the table here. I'm thinking about an anxiety that's driven subconsciously to live, to prosper, to survive, to flourish, to thrive by utilizing, not from faith, but from fear, every good gift from God so that you can be happy. All right, so if you are anxious like me and you think, oh man, I'm, just, no, I'm, just, I'm a piece of sea wrap. You know, and just, I just can't seek the kingdom. If I just seek the kingdom, I just need to seek the kingdom. I, you know, you, you just kind of get in this, ah, you know, and it's like, and suddenly the kingdom has become your source of anxiety. Because you can't seek it. You can't seek it enough. I, 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 that's not, that is not <laughs> what you, just because that you feel that way doesn't mean that that's you. Your feelings aren't you. But just because you feel something doesn't mean that it's you. It's just, it's just the way you feel in a, in a moment. So there, there's a true self, regenerated, resurrected by Jesus Christ, that, lit, that, that is us, that is ourself, and it deals with all sorts of things. It deals with anxiety, it deals, deals with fear, it deals with depression, it deals with sickness, it deals with irritability. And so it deals with all this stuff, right? And all these things make you think that that thing is what you are. And it's not. What, who you are and what you are is seated with Christ in the heavenlies. And what we do through the power of the Holy Spirit is we take these different thoughts and these parts captive and we... And we 
Submit them to the reign of Jesus Christ. And what you'll find out is in those moments when you're not plagued with anxiety, when you, when you experience love that flows, empathy that flows, sympathy that flows, a reasonable mind you, that, that, that seeks after God, you have been introduced to you in Christ. And that ex- in Christ, that is, exists in every one of you if you are in Christ. And sometimes it's just hard to peel everything back to get there. Because like I said earlier, it's really hard to be a person. Okay? And so, if, but when you get there, what you'll find is that kingdom of God in the hearts and souls of men reverberates with your inner person. And actually, from that flows all the fruit of the Spirit, right? That, that everybody needs. And as you grow... I know this is kind of getting a little, like, I can be very critical. If you don't know me, I can be very critical. When I am filled with the Spirit of God, I can be very encouraging and very uplifting. So depending on which one you're dealing with that day, that's kind of how you know what you're working with. So, but that's something I begin to learn about myself, Right? And, and, that, and that just takes a little bit of work to try to figure out, okay, I got to get back there. And it just, it just takes, you, you have to be gracious with yourself. You have to, you have to be patient. With, you have to be the things with yourself that God is with you. And who are you to deny yourself the very things that God says that you should have? I mean, that's what we do when we refuse to forgive ourselves. We say, who do you think you are forgiving me? Well, who's God in that situation? I mean, we don't feel like it. We feel very humble. Oh, Lord, I can't accept the forgiveness of someone like you. I am just a little peon. Well, somehow this little peon has managed to get up on God's throne, kick him out of it, and take a seat. Because the peon says, well, I can't receive that from you. Who do you think you are, peon? I'm just a peon. I mean, that's, that's the way pride works in humility. But what, what the, the Father knows that we need these things, but when we experience this unity, this oneness with Christ that's always there that we experience in different levels throughout our, our, our life, we seek his kingdom and his righteous reign and his rule. See, that's what we say the kingdom of God is. You ask me, hey, what's the kingdom of God? I would say it's God's reign and rule in the hearts of men. You know, some people would say the kingdom's the church, and I would say, I'm so sorry you think that. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm messing with you. Those of you who think that, you're okay. God's patient with us all. So we... we But that's what it is God's reign and rule in the hearts of men. And when we seek that in our own lives and the lives of other people, we see that spread, right? As the waters cover the as the waters cover the sea, we see that we see that spread. Then he ends, therefore don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And I end with this plea and a in a reflection back at the cross. What Jesus did when he died on the cross is he proved this text to be true. 100% absolutely true. And he said this, he taught this teaching knowing what he would do. Knowing what he would do to make that kingdom manifest. Knowing what he would do to light the spark that would engulf that ancient world that caused a little, a little bitty, you know, a little bitty band of 12, a little house church to completely take over. Most of the known world at that time. He knew what he would do to set that into action. He would die on a cross. He would take the sins of his people. He would, by faith, give them his righteousness and a Holy Spirit as the down payment of, of, of guarantee that he would be with them and he would reign and rule in their hearts through them. And what he is saying to us today is, you were created for this life, not for the other one. 
You were created to seek these things, not those things. You were created to seek not the things that everyone else sees, but the thing that very few do. Give your life to that. And that's my um, invitation to us this morning. I'm gonna pray. God, thank you so much for the way you love us. Thank you for your word. We're thankful for the life that it gives. We pray that it would make us a certain type of people, a, a people that are filled with a desire to see your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that we would be a manifestation of your kingdom in, in our lives, in our, in our marriages, in our different relationships, Lord, and that we would, we would give our pursuit to that, Lord, and that we would not be anxious about building something um, for our future because we know that you are the one that built our future. You built it on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, him, he himself being the chief cornerstone. You built that future on that foundation with the, the prophets and the apostles being laid on that, Lord. And we are all part of this wonderful temple that gives you praise and that, and, that, and that brings you so much joy. And we pray that you would delight our hearts in that. God, I pray if there's someone here that's not a Christian, Lord, that you would help them to see that what Christianity offers them in the person of Jesus is, is actual, actually the thing that they are longing for in their heart, that, that thirst that can't be quenched, that, that hunger that can't be fed, Lord, that, that it's there because they were made for you and that you died to, to bring them back to yourself in the person of Jesus Christ. And I pray you would grant them the gift of faith, that they would turn from their sins, and that they would embrace all that you are for them in the person of Jesus. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.